Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our session two. We are going to launch our second case presentation. So this case will be presented by Dr. Abel Rahman Nimari from the USA. He's the Associate Professor and Chief of Bariatric Surgery of the Carolinas Medical Center. He's the Secretary and Treasurer of IFSO and Founding President of the Middle East and North African Chapter of IFSO. So welcome, Abdurrahman. Following the case presentation, we will also have comments from, firstly, Dr. Estuardo Berans from Guatemala. He's the past president of the Guatemalan Association of Surgery, is the past president of the Guatemalan Society for Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery, and the current president of the Latin American chapter of IFSO. Welcome, Estuardo. Thank you for Next having we me. Have, we welcome. Next, we have Dr. Baram Abudaya from the USA. He is the Associate Professor of Medicine, Director of Advanced Endoscopy, Director of Metabolic and Bariatric Endoscopy at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. He's a recipient of multiple awards and grants in support of his research, including the Star of Science Award awarded to him by His Majesty King Abdullah II during the World Science Forum in the Dead Sea in Jordan 2017. It's a pleasure to have you, Baram. Next, we have Dr. Shelby Sullivan from the USA. She's the Director and Gastroenterology Metabolic and Bariatric Program at the University of Colorado at the School of Medicine. Welcome, Shelby. Last but not least, we have Dr. Mary O'Kane from the United Kingdom. She's a dietitian and she's the chair of the IFSO Integrated Health Committee. Mary led the development of the British Obesity Metabolic Surgery Society BOMS and the nutritional guidelines for the UK for the follow-up guidelines for patients undergoing bariatric surgery. Welcome, Mary. I'm now invite my co-moderator, Reem, to launch the poll. Hello, everyone, and, and thank you, Lillian. So we're going to launch the uh, second poll for this session. How do you evaluate a patient with GERD dysphagia and class 1 obesity and type 2 diabetes? Uh, first, an endoscopy and upper GI barium study, endoscopy and esophageal manometry, upper GI barium study and CT scan of the abdomen, history and physical examination is sufficient, or finally, evaluation by a bariatric surgeon. Please vote using the dashboard on the right of your screen. So uh, while we're waiting for the attendees uh, to answer, um, I'd like to ask uh, Abdul Rahman to comment on, uh, on this poll and what, what you think. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Reem. And I wanna thank IFSO and WGO for the invitation. I think what's important to note about reflux is that the disease um, is a disease where symptoms don't necessarily correlate with objective findings. So when someone has heartburn, um, you might wanna do an endoscopic evaluation. And if it shows significant reflux like Barrett's or uh, LAC or D esophagitis, maybe those patients, you don't need to do anything else. But especially in patients who are considering to have procedures like sleeve gastrectomy in our field, someone has reflux symptoms and they just have uh, not, not much on the endoscopy or grade A esophagitis, they might need a real objective testing maybe with a, a pH study. And the second important thing is, you know, when someone says they have dysphagia, I mean, that is just a very broad term and you need to really dig deep into that term and make sure whether this dysphagia is something recent, whether it's to liquids or solids and maybe start first with just getting them um, an x-ray test. Okay, and we have the results. Um, would you care to comment a little bit on the, on the results before we start the case presentation? Sure. I think I'm very pleased to see that evaluation by a bariatric surgeon is not uh, the first thing for this patient <laughs> uh, or that history and physical is sufficient because, because truly, or, or, or getting a CAT scan, I think the audience is, is right on the money. And I think both uh, options have an endoscopy, which is reasonable. Uh, getting a, a barium study first or proceeding 
uh, right away from pulmonometry will depend on the symptoms and dysphagia and both of them are appropriate answers. So I think the audience is on the money. Okay, well, thank you. And I'm going to invite Dr. Abdul Rahman Nimari to present his case. Uh, good morning. Um, it is my um, uh, pleasure and privilege to participate in the uh, combined um, World GI Organization and International Federation for Surgery of Obesity webinar. Uh, my name is Abdul Rahman Nimari. I am um, an associate professor and section chief of bariatric surgery at Atrium Health and have the privilege of um, uh, and pleasure of being the IFSO secretary treasurer. It is my honor today to be uh, with you to present a case uh, about uh, reflux class one obesity and type two diabetes. This is my disclosure slide. It has no bearing on the presentation. You can see uh, my procedure disclosure um, as well as uh, financial disclosure at the top. So our patient uh, GRD is a very um, a pleasant 43 year old female who's been having significant reflux. Um, uh, she also lately had dysphagia. She's had reflux for 10 years, daily heartburn, regurgitation, and cough at night. She takes PPIs and lately noticed dysphagia to solids. She's tried numerous times to lose weight, and whenever she loses weight, her reflux improves, but then um, she would regain the weight back. Um, she has class 1 obesity, a BMI 34 um, uh, kilogram per meter squared. She's been diabetic for seven years on uh, insulin, uh, as well as uh, metformin and glipizide. Her latest A1C is 9.5%, and her diabetes has not been well controlled. Uh, high blood pressure on two medications and uh, hyperlipidemia on a statin. She smokes a pack per day for the past 15 years and uh, would quit off and on, and her examination is largely unremarkable. Her endoscopy shows, as uh, the picture depicts, a three centimeter hiatal hernia, grade B esophagitis without Barrett's, and she was H pylori positive. She had a 48 hour Bravo capsule study that showed that on both days she has at least 125 episodes of reflux. The percent of the time where the pH uh, was low uh, was 8% on the first day, 12% on the second day, mostly in the supine position. She has a Demeester score of 48. Her manometry showed no motility disorders and the presence of a hiatal hernia. The patient is interested in a management strategy that minimizes the risk while address, addresses her reflux, dysphagia, uh, her weight issue, as well as her diabetes. Um, she's motivated to make a change and she's more concerned about not only reflux, but the fact that her diabetes is uncontrolled, as she was told this could affect her quality of life. Um, the patient is most interested in endoscopic options. She heard about the procedure called Strata. She wants to hear more about it, uh, as well as um, laparoscopic options that have lower risk. Uh, so she's heard about a procedure called Lynx. She also wants to hear about it. When it comes to other procedures, she wants to know if uh, having a fundoplication would help her reflux and if that's the best procedure for her. Uh, and she's very concerned about the options of metabolic and bariatric surgery, uh, especially room wide gastric bypass, as she heard many complications with that surgical option. If there is any uh, uh, surgery that would help her weight, uh, her consideration would be to have a sleeve gastrectomy. Again, uh, I would like to thank the um, World GI Organization and if so, for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul Rahman. A very interesting case. I'm going to invite our first speaker as a surgeon to comment on your case, Dr. Estuardo Barons. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. My name is Estuardo Barons, and I am the actual president of Latin American chapter of EFSO. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this webinar of the World Gastroenterology Organization, together with the International Federation of Societies of Obesity Surgery. Dr. Nimeri has presented us a very interesting case. These are my disclosures. I have nothing to disclose. I do not have any conflict of interest. My case makes disclosure. In the last 21 years, I'm doing bariatric and metabolic surgery 
2,841 cases in the last 21 years. This is a very interesting case of a young female patient, 43 years old, who has a metabolic syndrome, florid metabolic syndrome, with obesity class one, type two diabetes treated with insulin and two drugs, hypertension with two drugs, and hyperlipidemia with statins. A very heavy smoker patient, 20 cigarettes per day. And she's complaining of an important gastroesophageal reflux disease and hiatal hernia. The patient wants a relief. She's very well motivated to have a new life. The workup performed in this patient showed us that the, an upper GI endoscopy, she has a very important hiatal hernia, three centimeters wide. Achalasia was ruled out, no motility disorder, and H. pylori positive in this case. What are the alternatives? Well, we have to discuss this very well with the patient because she has a relief of the esophageal reflux, of the diabetes, hypertension, and the other comorbidities. The best alternative in this case is a wound wide gastric bypass plus closure of the hiatal hernia. If we perform a slip gastrectomy, the patient is going to have more reflux. We will discuss that later. The stretta procedure is non recommendable because it does not give any weight loss. The lynx is not recommendable because the patient is going to have only a poor weight loss. And the gastric missing film application is a very well performed procedure in this kind of patient with GERD, but the type two diabetes and the other comorbidities had to continue in medical treatment and it shows only poor weight loss. So the best alternative in this case must be a room wide gastric bypass laparoscopically performed with a closure of hiatal hernia. You can see in the picture, a wide hiatal hernia. And in the picture on the right, you can see the closure of the hiatal hernia. And this is the end result. You can see the gastroenostomy performed, and this is going to relieve the reflux. We're going to close the hernia. The patient is going to have a very good weight loss, and the type 2 diabetes and hypertension, hyperlipidemia are going to remit and control. So the patient is going to have a very quality of life. So the best alternative, as I said, is the room wide gastric bypass. All the time we have to think first in our patients. So the principle of primum non nocere, first do not harm, must prevail. prevail. This little gastrectomy is going to produce more gastroesophageal reflux disease, albeit the control of metabolic syndrome. And the, in the near future, the patient has to have a room wide gastric bypass. She's going to be converted. The endoscopic procedures, are not going to control the metabolic syndrome. So they are not useful in this kind of patient. The food application will control the GERD, but not the metabolic syndrome. So in these cases, we have to discuss with the patient very well, what does she want? If she wants the comorbidities be resolved, so the gastric bypass is the best procedure performed in these patients. So thank you very much to the World Gastroenterology Association and IFSU to give me the opportunity to comment this case. We'll discuss this case with the other professionals. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you very much. And I'd like to um, ask uh, Professor Barham Abudeye to talk to us about his uh, point of view. Dear colleagues, my name is Barham Abudeye and it's my pleasure to present the endoscopy perspective on the case presented by Dr. al -Nameri. These are my disclosures. It's very important to highlight the salient features of this case. We have a patient, a young patient with, uh, uh, with predominantly a representation of pathological reflux in the setting of a three centimeter hiatal hernia and esophagitis. She has a dysphagia, she's a smoker and she's worried about the risk of any intervention. Her obesity is mild and she has advanced diabetes. I don't think the current state of the literature offer clear guidance about the most optimal approach for such a patient because of the complex presentation. And that setting, it's important to uh, weigh the risks and benefits of each intervention and use the principle that the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. With that, it's very important to highlight that her predominant presentation is reflux. And reflux is an interplay between esophageal physiology, gastric accommodation and emptying, and the anti-reflux barrier made by the uh, diaphragmatic hiatus and the lower esophageal sphincter. It's not a hypersecretory disorder, thus just addressing parietal cell 
is not sufficient to address this disease. So the uh, gastric bypass is definitely a reasonable option in this case, but it's very important to weigh the risks and benefits if we're going to embark on a gastric bypass versus a minimally invasive approach to her presentation. So the first question in that quest is to answer, is Roa gastric bypass truly a, an anti-reflux procedure and the holy grail for GERD? Now, there's some evidence to suggest that it's a good procedure to decrease acidic reflux, but it's not necessarily improve uh, volume reflux uh, of weak acidic or alkaline uh, refluxate. This is a cross-sectional study of about 870 patients about 256 underwent a row gastric bypass and had endoscopy a few years after the procedure. Uh, and you could see that uh, the uh, acid reflux or uh, presence of esophagitis was present in about a third of the cohort, and that's heavily confounded by the presence of a hiatal hernia. So this is also a corroborating evidence from a nationwide cohort study that looked at adults with preoperative reflux who underwent gastric bypass. And they looked at remaining or recurrent reflux more than six months after surgery. This is from Sweden. And they showed that about 50% of the cohort uh, continued to have reflux or had recurrent symptoms requiring medication that remained stable up to 10 years after the procedure. So the issue is when you look at objective physiological measures of manometry and pH, that thorough gastric bypass does improve acid exposure time, but it does not significantly alter the total reflux episode, especially of alkaline or weakly acidic refluxate as shown in this meta-analysis. And actually the uh, accommodation of the pouch might be problematic, especially in the setting of a hiatal hernia. This is a patient subjective to endoflip uh, functional planimetry. And you could see that the uh, gastric pouch is not very compliant. And there's a hiatal hernia present that with a non-compliant pouch, the force of the, uh, of the uh, contractility is in a retrograde fashion to the esophagus, conducive to significant reflux in that setting. So if, uh, if the risks benefit of gastric bypass are not sufficient in this case, what alternative I could give you from an endoscopic perspective? And I would argue that a combination of a proper anti-reflux procedure, which is a hiatal hernia repair, plus fund duplication uh, and a minimally in invasive endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty would be a better option. This is a very similar case to the one presented at the Mayo Clinic with a small hiatal hernia, about three to five centimeters, that we corroborated with our surgical colleagues in order to repair the hiatal uh, defect uh, laparoscopically and offered either a transoral fund duplication or a partial to pay fund duplication combined with an endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, which is anatomy preserving. The advantages of the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty as shown in this functional MRI is it does not affect the, uh, the uh, innervation of the stomach, thus the motility is intact. There's no dissection of the ligament suspending, suspending the uh, stomach uh, with remaining accommodating small fundus, which also is not conducive to be a high pressure zone for reflux. You could see nine months after the procedure, the patient has normalization of her Demetri score and a significant weight loss with its change in BMI from 46 to 29. But you might tell me, wait a minute, Dr. Abu Daya, you forgot about the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room here is poorly controlled diabetes mellitus. And for that, I would refer you to an important study published in the New England Journal of Medicine and subject to you that the weight loss observed with the combination of hiatal hernia repair and endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty with a fund duplication uh, uh, is sufficient to have uh, improvement or remission of type 2 diabetes. Again, with this New England Journal of Study, they subjected 15 patients to gastric bypass, matched them to a cohort that underwent low caloric diet and achieved the same exact 18% total body weight loss. They did a battery of sophisticated testing, including a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic pancreatic clamp that showed identical improvement in both groups. Uh, and when they looked at 24 hours glucose profile, uh, 24 hours insulin profile, beta cell function, and body composition all were equivalent as long as the weight loss uh, was significant, and in that case, more than 80% uh, total body weight loss. And with that, I conclude and thank you for your kind attention.
Thank you so much. And uh, next we have Dr. Shelby Sullivan and um, we'll hear her presentation. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Shelby Sullivan and I'm going to be discussing this case today. And I'd first like to thank the organizers for inviting me to discuss the, this case that we'll be talking about, including a patient with class one obesity, GERD and type two diabetes. These are my disclosures. I've been involved in a number of research studies on endoscopic bariatric therapies, and I consult for a number of endoscopic bariatric therapy companies. So there are several issues with the patient that was presented today in this section, and that includes the BMI of the patient. She has a BMI of 34, which in the United States would preclude her from getting insurance coverage from many insurance carriers for a bariatric surgical procedure. The next issue with this patient is that she has GERD that's uncontrolled on a PPI, and she also has a significant hiatal hernia of three centimeters. This also affects what kind of therapies we would be willing to do and what kind of surgeries we'd be willing to do for this patient. She's also a smoker, so that puts her at risk for surgeries, but also puts her at risk for cardiovascular disease as well. Her diabetes is not currently at goal, and she's also not on medications that would be recommended as second-line treatments in the American Diabetes Associated Association treatment algorithms for the treatment of diabetes. And this is an important point. We're going to go over that right here. So this is a very busy slide, but essentially this goes over the algorithm that the American Diabetes Association recommends for the treatment of patients with diabetes. The first-line therapy for any patient with diabetes in in America, the recommendation is to start off with metformin. The next therapies, though, really depend on patient characteristics. And we're going to talk about this in this next box that I've highlighted here in a little bit more detail. So the next step is really to decide to, think, to determine whether or not the patient has risks for cardiovascular disease or currently has cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, or heart failure. And if that is the case, in particular with cardiovascular disease, the next therapies that you would want to consider as the second line medications would include either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor. So they both have indications for lowering cardiovascular risk. And in this patient who has diabetes, a class one obesity, has a history of smoking, has hyperlipidemia and hypertension, that patient is at high risk for cardiovascular disease. It's also most likely based on off all of these characteristics that she likely has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as well, which again is putting her at a higher uh, risk category for cardiovascular disease. These medications have data with um, lowering risk of cardiovascular disease and in particular, GLP-1 receptor agonists also have benefit not only for diabetes, but also for patients who have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as well. In addition to that, both of these medications have weight loss benefits, the highest weight loss benefit being with semaglutide. So then when we really think about the, the options for this patient and how I would think about this patient in my clinical practice, first and foremost, regardless of what therapy you were doing, you would want to have this patient quit smoking. And one of the things you can add to help with the patient uh, smoking cessation is bupropion, which does have an indication specifically for smoking cessation and can also help with weight loss as well. So the next thing I would do is have shared medical decision-making with the patient. And the first thing I would discuss is whether or not the patient would accept a surgery or a procedure. If the answer to that is no, then we go with really intensifying both medications and lifestyle therapy. And I would talk to the patient and try to get the patient on a GLP-1 receptor agonist, specifically semaglutide. This would have to be done in conjunction with the patient's either endocrinologist or their primary care physician because their insulin does need to be adjusted and decreased while they're starting this GLP-1 receptor agonist because it will lower their need for insulin. I would also intensify their lifestyle therapy. This is also, this is both to help for weight loss and also to change behaviors that may be worsening reflux. And then we would make sure the patient is on high dose PPI therapy and caraphate. If the patient is willing to undergo a surgery or a procedure, I would first talk to the patient about gastric bypass. Now, again, in the United States, this is likely not going to be covered by insurance because her BMI is less than 35, but we could still discuss the option and also consider whether or not the patient may be able to pay out of pocket. And this is different for other countries. In addition to that, I would still discuss whether or not the patient may benefit from, GL from, from a GLP-1 receptor agonist. The other option is that the patient could undergo an anti-reflux surgery 
that would help with reflux and uh, to treat her hiatal hernia, and could also undergo an endoscopic bariatric therapy, specifically an endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty or the Aspire cyst system. In this patient, I would not proceed with an intragastric balloon because that could worsen her reflux. And if she did undergo an anti-reflux surgery in her foregut, that would be a complete contraindication to getting an intragastric balloon. In conjunction with those therapies, I would again also think about adding a GLP-1 receptor agonist, specifically semaglutide, to help treat her diabetes, lower her cardiovascular risk, and again, if she has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which she likely does, would also help with that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Shelby. Last but not least, let's hear from Mary O'Kane the wise words of a dietitian. Mary. Thank you, Dr. Namiri, for uh, this case presentation. And it's a real pleasure uh, to be taking part in this webinar today. These are my disclosures. So as a dietitian, I'm interested in the whole person and I want to know more about the social history. Um, the weight history of this patient is already known and she's had many past attempts at trying to lose weight. And I'm also very interested in her current dietary intake and her eating patterns and how this fit into her typical day. I'm concerned that she has dysphagia and um, I would be looking at the quality of her diet and also requesting nutritional bloods to make sure that she hasn't got any uh, nutritional deficiencies. I would like to know whether or not she has a history of eating disorders. Um, and then when we're looking at the options, we're looking at intensive uh, lifestyle interventions with or without um, anti-obesity medications and also bariatric and metabolic surgery. So there's many recommendations about what people should do with obesity and type 2, type 2 diabetes. And these Canadian guidelines highlight the fact that lifestyle interventions are where people can lose five, uh, 7 to 15% of the total initial weight loss will help to improve diabetes control and help resolve some of those other comorbidities. There's lots of evidence pointing towards this, and I'm just going to talk about two studies, which is Look Ahead and the Direct Study. And both of these had patients with overweight and obesity and type 2 diabetes. In the Look Ahead study, those who received the intervention, because this is a randomized control trial, had structured meal plans and meal replacements over the year, and then years two to eight focused on weight maintenance. And what they found was that those who achieved 7% weight loss had improved glycemic control. The direct study is also in RCT. And in this, for the first 12 to 20 weeks, uh, those receiving the intervention had low calorie liquid meal replacements. And these were just over 800 calories a day. This was then supported with food reintroduction and a focus on weight maintenance. And what they found that a year that if people had managed to, that 46% of participants had managed to achieve diabetes remission a year and 36% at two years. And those who lost 10 kilograms had good outcomes and those who lost 15 kilograms had even better outcomes. However, one must remember in this, this study is that people had type 2 diabetes for less than six years and were not yet on insulin. So there's evidence pointing to the fact that if people um, have interventions early uh, when they've uh, had the recent onset diabetes and are not yet on insulin, there's a greater chance of people having uh, diabetes remission. But obviously our lady has had diabetes for some time and is already on insulin. Also, a number of guidelines recognise that early intervention, um, again with recent onset diabetes and also with class 1 diabetes, uh, obesity is more likely to achieve better outcomes. And the, and the Canadian guidelines, like others, recommend that bariatric surgery should be considered if people are not um, optimally managed with medical treatments. And in this study, the Stampede study looked at uh, intensive medical treatment, which would have included anti obesity medications versus bariatric surgery in people with type 2 diabetes and obesity, and there's a five-year follow-up. So for me, what's interesting in this study is that it's a mean duration of diabetes for eight years, 
and that 36% of those going forward for surgery have class 1 uh, obesity. And what they find is that five years that those who go forward for surgery have a greater weight loss, they have better diabetes control, and there's a reduction in medications, including insulin. So this is definitely an option for this patient. However, it's not just about the weight loss, it's also about weight maintenance and avoiding weight regain. And I just mentioned the SOS study, and this is not a randomised controlled trial. It's where people went either down the surgical arm for weight loss or medical treatment, which should include obviously lifestyle interventions. And what you can see in the left hand graph is the 20 year outcomes. And it shows that those who go forward for arthritis surgery are likely to have a lower weight um, at 20 years than those who went down the medical intervention group. But we must remember that this is not a randomised controlled trial. People were lost to follow up. And even with the surgical group, there can be some uh, intense weight regain. When we look at the ones who went in the medical group in the right hand graft, you can see that after two years, many people will regain weight and for some it will be significant. However, I want to just highlight that at 10 years, that there were a number of people who were still managing to achieve those clinically significant weight losses. So what's the best for this patient? I think it's really important that we discuss options and this could in include the intensive lifestyle interventions with or without the anti-obesity medications. Another option obviously is the bariatric and metabolic surgery. And as a dietitian, what I want to do is present objective information to this patient, empowering her to make an informed decision as to what is best for her at that time. So thank you for your time and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Mary. Well, we're going to open this for discussion with the panelists as well as um, the speakers. I'll also like to remind our attendees that they can actually send in their questions and we'll try and answer those questions as well. My first question is to our panelists, Gerhard Praga. We heard that this patient does not qualify for metabolic or bariatric surgery in the USA. Would this patient qualify for surgery in Austria and in Europe? Uh, in Europe, we have a very, um, uh, very different situation. We have very strong public health care systems. At the moment in Austria, she will not uh, have coverage from the public health care insurance. Saying that in Switzerland, she would have coverage. So you have very different situations. Uh, I would try to fight for this patient for coverage. So you can get an individual solution. So I'm very confident that even in Austria, although it's not covered on average, you would get coverage for this patient. Uh, I think this would be a very nice uh, case of real metabolic surgery as the weight loss is not in the focus, but with the uncontrolled diabetes and reflux, uh, I would totally agree that UNY gastric bypass is the way to go for me, at least at this patient. Are you concerned about her sm smoking history? Definitely. I think this is something we have to consider. She must quit smoking before having surgery, or at least that's what I would stress on. And of course, from a surgical point of view, you can play around with the size and length of your pouch. The more uh, stomach you have in the food stream, the higher the risk for an asthmatic ulcer uh, will, will be. Eamon, I'd like to follow up by asking you, um, do you think there's any undiagnosed motility disorders in, in, these, in these patients? Um, should they undergo manometry routinely, even though it's sort of not standard of care at the moment, unless they have any symptoms? Because so, sometimes we've seen patients with bariatric surgery sort of five, 10 years out to present with things like achalasia. Echolasia would be my only worry, um, and that can be actually screened for maybe more simply by doing a time barium study. Not easy to get in a lot of places. But there's one other point I wanted to bring up and that we, we seem to have forgotten. This patient was helicobacter pylori positive, as far as I remember, correct? Yeah. Yes. 
So we're talking about a patient who's got a precancerous condition of her stomach, and we're talking about excluding the stomach. So what comments do the surgeons have to make about this? So I would, of course, eradicate these patients. We, we do endoscopy in all our patients preoperatively. And if we have H5 pillory positive patients, we do eradicate them. That's our strategy. I do agree. But it wasn't mentioned. That is, that is true. But even for any of the endoscopic procedures as well, I always check H. pylori before any endoscopic procedure, any endoscopic bariatric therapy. I just want to mention that after sleeve gastrectomy, we've just published a few weeks ago our 15 years data, and we also published our 10 years data. And after 10 years, this is a real refluxogenic operation. And I have no idea why an endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy uh, would be different in that, in that part of the game. Uh, and Farham can speak to this as well, but there's there has, has actually been a comparison. Uh, Vivek Kambari published a series comparing sleeve gastrectomy to endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, and there's less reflux um, that occurs after endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty compared to sleeve gastrectomy. And part of the reason why, and, and, and Barham brought this up in his talk, is that you're, you are leaving the top part, the fundus of the stomach open. So you do have this, not, this essentially non-pressurized system at the very top of the stomach. And so that may contribute to the lower rates of reflux that we see after these patients. And, and from, a, from an anecdotal standpoint, clinically, um, most of my patients after endoscopic sleep gastroplasty do not have reflux or do not develop reflux symptoms. I agree with Dr. Sullivan, and I will add, we looked at this in the MERIT, which is the U.S. multi-center randomized trial, which will come out soon, hopefully in IFSO, uh, that reflux is not a major contributor to the endoscopic sleep. So I think uh, we've settled that issue, and now there's actually pH per data that, that will support that notion as well. My concern is also the fading of efficacy with time which we see in the, in the sleeve gastrectomy, uh, and I would also expect for the endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, but this is just my personal concerns. And that's a, that's a real concern. And that's why the, when, if, if I have to have a crystal ball and say, what's the future? The future is gonna be, you, you have two strategy. One is a strategy to, to lose the weight and put the disease into remission. And I say remission, not cure. There is no cure for this disease. And the second would be for weight maintenance with, with a multitude of tools that we have at our disposal now, including a lot of good medications. So I think the future is gonna be as such uh, with, with these combinations. And I think so, the other uh, thing that we need to, uh, the other thing that we need to keep in mind, and, and, and Barham just made a point on this, is that there is no perfect procedure. And especially for those of us, about a quarter of my population is actually patients who've reg regained weight after gastric bypass. So there's re weight regain that can occur with any procedure. And I think that, that, uh, that we need to be vigilant about it and develop um, management strategies for that. But especially there's one comment, if there's one comment I would make to support what Gerhard said, is that five years after sleeve gastrectomy, when surgeons were told that it might cause reflux, they said it doesn't. We did not figure out that it causes reflux and Barrett's except 10 years out, 12 years out, 13 years out. Uh, if I may, I'm going to be a little controversial here, Abdurrahman. You know, this lady that you presented obviously has florid metabolic syndrome. But what worries me most about this patient, the characteristic of her smoking, she's a heavy smoker. And from a, from a surgeon's point of view, who's treated these patients for over 20 years, the thing that scares me most, the thing that, calls, that gets me up at night most often is marginal ulcers and their bleeding and their pain and their perforation. And uh, I've learned over the years that heavy smokers are simply not going to quit. They're not going to quit smoking. Or if they do, they come back and start smoking again after surgery. And uh, frankly, to me, that is a huge factor in my decision-making process. Now, we could give her a sleeve. We could fix the hiatus hernia at the right time, at the same time. And, uh, and then uh, who knows, the weight loss might uh, reverse her GERD, her esophagitis, 
and then survey her for, uh, for the occurrence of Barrett's. And frankly, I, I know I shouldn't be saying this, but the sleeve gastrectomy is, it doesn't burn bridges. Worst case scenario, if her reflux returns or Barrett's develops, then you can convert her. The other important point is the lady came asking for a sleeve. And the other thing that I've learned over the years is you have to listen to the patient because you could convince her to get the gastric bypass, but she's going to be always hostile about it. She's going to say, I did not want this operation. Just some thoughts to bear. So Summer, you're gonna give a sleeve gastrectomy and repair a high to hernia. Would you give her a sleeve gastrectomy and a lynx? Uh, yeah, possibly a lynx or maybe reserve the lynx to later or reserve the strata to later. If the, I, I'd give the chance to see if the weight loss alone might improve her reflux. If it doesn't, you know, if you have a, a, a well-constructed sleeve and a patient who's losing weight, I think the chances are her GERD will reverse. Remember, as, as uh, Barham very eloquently uh, demonstrated, the, the Ruin Y gastric bypass uh, it does not, is not the, is not the penis, it, it's not the holy grail, as you said. At least 15 to 20% of patients with gastric bypass have reflux disease. So, yeah, I would probably just fix the hernia and just reserve endoscopic procedures or the links uh, should the symptoms uh, recur. One yes, point I would add to this discussion is there is dysphagia as well. And I have to say it's there is an evolving, still premature, but evolving body of literature to suggest a new entity that's called POSIT or post obesity surgery esophageal dysfunction. It's a pattern that we still do not understand. It's characterized by dysphagia, characterized by absence of secondary peristalsis and ineffective esophageal motility. It's hypothetically due to increased afterload on the esophagus from years of exposure to high pressure zones. Still, we don't know if it's reversible or not, but this is something to keep in mind with, 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 these, uh, with these procedures for sure. Can I ask about the links? Is the hiatal hernia not too big for a lynx? In this case, it is. And also, lynx could uh, make her dysphagia worse, even though her manometry does not show yeah. motility disorder. That's why I would just repair the hernia and then see what happens. If I, if I would make just one comment, I think uh, uh, Shelby Sullivan really is very astute at picking up that the patient is not on the best medical therapy. Uh, I mean, this patient has several things that need time with a dietitian, an obesity medicine specialist, time to treat H. pylori, get her on the right medication, and maybe in six months, you'll be a different patient. I can, I can tell you that, you know, one of the first things that I do when I see patients is first, what's going on with their current medications that they're on. I am not a diabetologist. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't, suggest that I am one, but I do try to follow the, the, the guidelines. And it's, it is amazing what sometimes what can happen when you get patients off of medications that are kind of con that are contributing to their weight gain and onto medications that, that can cause weight loss. And in this patient, if she's a super responder to semaglutide, then, you know, you might get, you might, you might get, you know, 15% total body weight loss, even at the diabetes dose of semaglutide. That's not going to be the average, but some patients are going to get there with that. And then would you need to even, you know, go to a surgery or, you know, you would still consider maybe an anti-reflux surgery at that point. But I would okay. be hesitant to do any refluxogenic operation in this patient because her Demeester score is exceedingly high. It's more in the supine position, which tells you she has proximal migration uh, of the Z-line already. She has a hiatal hernia. And, and, and in a, a patient like this, I'd be very hesitant to offer her anything that causes reflux. One thing we do in the US for someone like this is to approach the insurance company, not as a weight loss operation, but to tell them this is a patient with documented reflux who needs surgical therapy and show them the literature that a fund duplication has worse outcomes and a high recurrence rate long-term. And that the procedure we're doing is merely to treat reflux. And we've been very successful in convincing insurance companies to offer her once she's ready a run wide gastric bypass at this BMI or even lower if we prove that the number one indication is not weight, it actually reflux. And I think it, that might be region to region dependent too, because we have not had as much luck in Colorado with that. 
Mary, um, there's a question for you. I mean, you eloquently showed the SOS study with weight regain, and we often see that with various different types of uh, surgery, also with different types of endoscopy. So how do you help your uh, patients achieve a targeted weight loss and maintain that weight loss? How often do you see them? What kind of diet do you recommend um, going long term after they finish their bariatric uh, diet? I think one of the first things I need to mention is that the long-term follow-up available to many patients isn't as long as it should be because it should be lifelong. Um, but certainly in that first year, we'd, there'd be intense dietetic support, helping the patient reintroduce foods, reintroduce textures, actually learn to eat the smaller portions and actually gradually moving that person back towards three meals a day. And there's some interesting work that's been done by Dr. Mitchell and his colleagues looking at the fact that if people can return to three meals a day, stop uh, eating before they feel full, that they're more active, that they don't graze, um, they're going to have better outcomes. And, and this is saying uh, from many studies as well. So it's about how that first year is more focused on the weight loss. The second year is on the weight maintenance. And then really what we need to be able to do is actually help people have that longer term follow-up but in the UK certainly in our health service we're only able to give two years follow-up and then we have to discharge back to primary care and what I'd like to see that there is a model even if people just have access to annual reviews uh, and just that annual monitoring so we can actually keep a check because inevitably there can be weight gain as we age but for some it can be more intense than others and then I think it's already mentioned that the new medication that's coming online which is um, not as available in the UK, that that may also help that weight maintenance phase. Thank you. And I know we focused a lot on, on uh, GERD, but I want to sort of ask uh, Professor Kasama, would you uh, consider if, if the patient, let's say, didn't really have GERD and just the diabetes part, what, what would be the optimal surgery that you would, uh, you would offer her? We discussed this sort of in the first session, but I think with the case presentation, I want to hear the panel's opinion as well. Yeah, I, I would like to offer her uh, gastric bypass with a uh, hernia repair. So actually that uh, she had H. pylori positive, but uh, if eradication works, it doesn't matter so much. So that the gastric bypass is uh, the better option for her, even she had the hiatus hernia or not. So the, in, from the viewpoint of uh, remission of type 2 diabetes, I think that the gastric bypass is good for her. And also the, the gastric bypass is good for her, the guard, if the, she had uh, had Sanya repair simultaneously. Also, she may have the, the one of the the most the biggest objective on gastric bypass is her smoker. If she can quit smoking, the gastric bypass is the best. But if she cannot, the sleeve gastrectomy is the second best option. Thank you. Um, Barham, do you routinely do endo flip on, uh, on, on these patients? I saw, obviously you did it in this patient who had GERD and dysphagia-like symptoms, but uh, sort of going back to my question to Eamon, um, what about the un undiagnosed uh, manometric issues? Yeah, Arim, so uh, thank you, Dr. Sharha. This is, it's an interesting phenomenon that we recently report in the Red Journal, the American Journal of Gastroenterology, this entity of POSIT. Uh, or process of geo surgery and scopic dysfunction uh, or esophageal dysfunction. And since then, we've been interested in seeing what, what, what's, why, why this happens. Is it a chronicity issue? Is it a time dependent phenomena? Uh, so uh, on a study, we've been doing in the flip on, on obese matched cohort versus those undergoing bariatric surgery at different time points to try to elucidate some of the uh, functional uh, physiological changes that happen to the esophagus with time after the different iteration, whether it's uh, obesity alone, uh, endoscopic procedure, uh, surgical procedures such as sleeve and raw gastric bypass. So I would say we've done it now. I think we have a cohort of close to 120 patients, and we're going to continue to do this to hopefully get more clarity on what's happening to the esophageal physiology with time after these operations, which is an important metric that we need to 
follow uh, for sure. Great, thank you. And I guess this also follows uh, the second question from the audience. Also, you you could probably answer, uh, or any of the surgeons who do uh, the combined TIF procedure. So, what about the combined CIF, uh, C TIF followed by a surgical sleeve, not an endoscopic sleeve? I, I guess any of the surgeons, if you have experience, and I know Barhan has some experience as well. I haven't. You do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Barham, then I guess the question goes to you again. So yeah, the, I mean, that's, that's the key is, again, if we go to the prison, the interest of the patient is the only interest and we work as a team to take care of the patient, then you'll see these collaboration between surgery and endoscopy to achieve something that individually we cannot achieve together. So yes, we do collaborate with our thoracic surgeons a lot to offer these uh, hiatal hernia repairs plus a toupee with an endoscopic weight loss options special for those with GERD and BMI about 35, because right now there's the only alternative is gastric bypass as, as our colleagues stated. So these collaborative procedure happens a lot actually, and we'll continue to push the limit with this collaboration. And I think the future is as such is we are one team taking care of a patient and we should do it together for, and for with the best interest of the patient for sure. Okay, great. Um, Mary, this question's for you, but then I'll throw it out to the, uh, the rest because I know I often get asked this as well. Um, do you recommend intermittent fasting as a way of, of weight maintenance or weight loss? And if so, for how long? And which type of intermittent fasting do you do? Is it this sort of the two five or just the reducing the number of hours? I think I'm always guided by the patient because uh, different things work for different people and there is no evidence as yet that one diet is superior to the other. So for some people, if intermittent fasting works for them, happy to work along with them, make sure that what they're doing is safe, that it's nutritious, that they can afford it and they can adhere to it. Um, but equally, if they want to try some other way to lose weight, I'm quite happy to support that as well. But the recent reviews I've seen don't show that one way of trying to lose weight by diet is actually superior to another sort of diet. Great, thank you. And Professor Prager, yeah. Uh, I, um, if you present this case to uh, 100 surgeons, we're going to have a lot of opinions, but most of them are going to say that this is going to be a uh, gastric bypass procedure. And I have a question for the surgeons. The length of the limbs in this case if a gastric bypass is done. Thank you. Uh, I would, uh, if, uh, should I start? If I was uh, operating, if I was going to do a gastric bypass on the patient, the BP, the, sorry, the rule limb would be at least 100 centimeters because she already has a tendency to have uh, re acid reflux. And so we want to prevent or, or minimize the chance that she might have a uh, uh, alkaline or bile reflux. Um, uh, with regards to the other limbs, you know, her BMI is 34, I believe. So uh, a, a, a dramatic weight loss is really not necessarily an objective here. So I would, I would make sure that the BP limb was no more than, uh, certainly less than one meter, maybe 60, 70 centimeters long. Gerhard? Uh, yes, for me, I would, we go for the elementary limb a minimum of 70 centimeters uh, because this is the minimum length to prevent bile reflux. So I'm pretty in, in accordance with uh, Summer and for the BP limb as short as possible around 40, 50 centimeters. So I can just echo what you said. Dr. Mary? Yeah. Uh I agree, 100 centimeter rule limb, 50 centimeter BPLM uh, for the same reasons outlined by Samer and Gerhard. Dr. Kazama? Yeah, uh, 50 centimeter of BP limb and uh, one, one meter of the alimentary limb, just like the other. So we surgeons, we do agree that this case is fits for a gastric bypass, is that correct? Let's hear from Lillian. I have not heard the limb length from Lillian. No, I, I do agree. 50 and 100 is what I would do. But the second question, we do surgeons 
are, do you agree that this is case for a gastric bypass? I heard that Summer says- I, that I don't agree. I, I, I'm, more, I'm more concerned. I think, I predict that I will have more problems with marginal ulcers than with reflux in this patient if I give her, you know, the, the chances of having reflux issues with the sleeve, I think are going to be less than the chances of having smoking related complications, even in the face of maximum PPI prophylaxis. So if I can make a comment, I think because she has objective evidence of reflux with very high Demister score, I'd be hesitant to give her a sleeve. I, as I said, I think she deserves to spend some time with a dietitian and an obesity medicine specialist to better control her, her diabetes and maybe control her weight a little bit. Uh, but I do think uh, marginal ulcer um, it will prove to become a technical complication just like internal hernia. The size of the pouch we make uh, affects the margin also significantly. We now have literature to show that H. pylori doesn't. Uh, smoking does, so the time she'll spend with the obesity medicine specialist is also a time for me to understand her, her uh, you know, smoking behavior, but I would certainly uh, spend time with the team and then ruin why gastric bypass. I fully agree with Abdel Rahman. I would not do a sleep gastrectomy in a patient who suffers from GERD preoperatively. So I'm going to end at this controversial uh, note. I think the key, the key answer here is to listen to our patients, understand their comorbidities and their habits, because that could interfere with uh, any type of surgery that we choose. Thank you again to our panelists and speakers um, and uh, my co-moderator for a great uh, second session. And we'll be back after this break.
Welcome back, everyone, and uh, welcome to our final session on, um, on uh, the impact of uh, COVID, the other pandemic, on uh, this obesity, the ongoing pandemic. So we thought this would be a very interesting and uh, hopefully lively discussion. I'm going to first uh, start by introducing our panelists and our speakers. We have uh, Dr. Arya Sharma from Canada, who's a professor emeritus of medicine and past chair in obesity research and management at the University of Alberta in Canada. He's also the past clinical co-chair of the Alberta Health Service Obesity Program. He's the founder and scientific director of the Obesity uh, Canada, which is formerly the Obesity, um, the Canada Obesity Network. Um, and he is a fellow of the Canadian Academ uh, Academy of Health Sciences and past president of the Canadian Association of Bariatric Physicians and Surgeons. Secondly, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Lou Aroni, who uh, works uh, at uh, Wild Cornell, where I work. So um, welcome. He's a professor of metabolic research, and, me and he's the medical director of the Comprehensive Weight Loss uh, Control Center. Dr. Aroni is a leading authority on obesity and its treatment uh, at Wild Cornell and also state-of-the-art uh, multidisciplinary obesity research treatment center in the division of endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. He's the past chairman of uh, <clears throat> He's a past chairman of the American Board of Obesity Medicine and the former president of the Obesity Society. He's also the founder and CEO of BMIQ, a web-based weight management system for the healthcare providers. Welcome, Dr. Aroni. Um, secondly, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. John Morton. John Morton is the system lead for the surgical quality and bariatric services in the Yale New Haven Health System of six hospitals and the vice chair for quality division chief for bariatric and minimally invasive surgery and a professor in the Department of Surgery at the Yale School of Medicine. He served as the, uh, as the Chief of Bariatric and Minimally Invasive Surgery, Clinical Chief for the Bariatric and Metabolic Interdisciplinary Clinic, and the Director of Bariatric and Minimally Invasive Surgery for <clears throat> at Stanford University School of Medicine from 2003 to 2019. So welcome. And now our speakers. We have Professor Scott Shakura, who is the Professor of Surgery at Harvard Medical School. He's a director of the Center for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery at the Brigham and Women's um, Hospital in Boston. He's the president-elect of the International Federation for the Surgery of Obesity and Metabolic Disorders. And he's currently the editor-in-chief of, uh, of Obesity Surgery. Welcome. We also have uh, Dr. Christine Steer, who is a uh, surgeon and endoscopist uh, from the University of Hospital of Warsburg in Germany. She's the head of uh, surgical endoscopy department, the head of the Interdisciplinary Obesity Center, and she's a member of the IFSO Endoscopy Committee. We also have uh, Dr. Ivo Buskowski, who is uh, from Italy. <laughs> he is a trained diagnostic and operative gastrointestinal endoscopist and biliopancreatic endoscopist with a fellowship at the Digestive Endoscopy Unit of the Catholic University of Rome, uh, which is directed by Costa Mania. He is the instructor and member of the Faculty of the European Endoscopy uh, Training Center, and his particular interest is simulators, ERCP, and endoscopy, uh, endoscopic devices for weight loss. He's also a co-investigator of uh, several trials at the Catholic University. And uh, last but not, uh, not least, we have uh, Julie uh, Parrott, who is the Bariatric Nutrition Care Coordinator at Temple University Hospital, Philadelphia. Uh, she's an adjunct assistant professor at Rutgers University at the Department of Nutritional Sciences and a visiting research fellow faculty of uh, health sciences and well-being at the University of Sunderland. So welcome all. Um, and thank you very much um, for uh, being in our, in our session. I'd first like to uh, start by launching our, uh, our poll. And the bariatric surgery, the poll uh, states, the bariatric surgery performed on low risk patients demonstrated that there was a high perioperative complication rate. Surgeons had a high incidence of contracting COVID-19. BMI was shown to be an independent risk factor for complication. 
and surgery during the pandemic had a very high complication rate. And uh, while uh, patients are uh, patients, while the uh, attendees are answering this question, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Shakur to comment on um, on this poll and what you think the answers uh, should be. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's an absolute honor to be part of this and also to be connected with so many of the greats in our field. Just the names you mentioned alone is an all-star lineup. Uh, if you go back to the lockdown, which happened pretty much at the same time around the world, there was generalized panic through the medical community because we didn't know a lot about the virus and we didn't know what we didn't know. Um, so what they did was locked everything down, partly to uh, reduce the risk of transmission of the virus, but also partly because they had to shift those same resources, such as ventilators and beds, out of the ICUs and up to the, uh, uh, excuse me, out of the ORs and up to the ICUs because there were so many patients being admitted that had to be ventilated due to their COVID. So to accomplish that wisely and pretty much consistently around the world, the uh, what was considered to be elective cases were all closed and shut down for the length of the uh, lockdown. And what we know now was that that probably was unnecessary, number one. And number two, that patients who have the complications of obesity have more risk factors with that than they did with the virus. Therefore, preventing them from having timely surgery probably hurt a number of patients who might have developed complications or other problems while they were waiting for the lockdown to end and the ORs to be opened up again. But also because if you look in the literature, we learned a number of things. Number one, the transmission was not spread out of the virus was not spread out through the health community. Uh, there were no reported cases of surgeons, anesthesiologists uh, of any significant number getting COVID. And I think because the, they followed universal precautions. In addition, patients who had surgery prior to the uh, risk of COVID were not at any higher risk of developing COVID. In fact, it appeared it might've been uh, somewhat protective. And the numbers of patients who had bariatric surgery who then went and uh, well, then were followed, very, very few of them came down with COVID. And those that did, it was a much more mild experience than for others. So there may have been some protection to it. We also learned that BMI was an independent risk factor for complications, that patients who uh, were uh, higher BMIs had a greater risk of being transferred to an ICU and intubated. So in retrospect, we probably could have continued to perform surgery on uh, patients of weight during the lockdown. We didn't have to shut them out completely. And uh, maybe next, uh, fortunately, there will, hopefully won't be a next time, but if there was a next time, maybe we would know better. Hopefully not. So the answers are, are here on our right. Um, I know you touched upon the answer, but uh, would you care to comment before we start your presentation? Uh, just that uh, the people with high BMIs were more likely to get COVID and more likely to get a, a, a fatal COVID infection, and that bariatric surgery might have been protective for these same people who had that surgery prior to the lockdown. And lastly, that we maybe should reconsider locking down completely bariatric surgery because it is not elective surgery. We're treating diseases with it as we've heard all morning. Great, thank you. And without further ado, we'd like to ask you to present uh, um, your talk on surgery and COVID. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Scott Shakora, and I'm gonna speak about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on patients with obesity, as well as the bariatric surgeons. These are my disclosures. None of them have any bearing on this presentation. Well, we all know the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown resulted in dramatic changes to patient care, especially in surgery. All elective surgeries were postponed to limit patient exposure, but also to free up hospital resources to care for the COVID patients. Hospital and government policies were created to limit the spread of the pandemic 
and care algorithms were created uniquely for COVID. This presentation will review how these policies affected bariatric metabolic surgery. Well, there are a number of issues that have to be addressed. First and foremost, is bariatric metabolic surgery truly elective? It was considered so by most of the world and the cases were postponed when they needed to shut down ORs. But should those patients uh, have been offered surgery because of their comorbid conditions? And as you know, the clock is ticking on these patients. If they don't have surgery, they may die from heart disease and diabetes, et cetera. We do know that patients with severe obesity are at greater risk of contracting COVID, and patients awaiting bariatric surgery are at risk of developing one of the complications of their obesity-related diseases that I just mentioned. Will patients be at a higher risk for complications if they have surgery during the pandemic? And what about the bariatric surgeon? Are they at increased risk being in the operating room, operating on COVID patients? Well, we have to, first of all, prioritize who gets that surgery since we're limiting the surgery to uh, preserve resources. And we can either look at the low risk population where we would expect the complication rates to be lower, but maybe the benefits to be less because they're healthier as opposed to the higher risk patients where the surgery may be more difficult and there may be more issues to contend with for recovery, but these patients have more to gain from the surgery. The world basically selected the low risk patient to reopen the operating rooms with. However, I once again would put a plug in that we should consider the high risk patient and not completely shut them out because they are so needy of having these bariatric procedures performed. What about the eligibility for surgery? This here by Angrasani is basically the uh, algorithm used most places to qualify patients for surgery. And what they were looking at are basically the healthier patients, no past history of COVID, younger age, lower BMI, less likely to have comorbid conditions. But once again, I wanna make a plug that we should at least consider some of the higher risk patients for surgery because they need it so badly. So patients who had COVID but fully recover, patients who are older, up to age 75, higher BMIs with medical conditions, assuming those conditions are well controlled. And this would be my eligibility list for bariatric surgery. Now, we do know that obesity is a risk factor for contracting COVID and for having more severe cases of COVID. And to show you a little bit of data, this study looked at 700 patients that came to the hospital, were diagnosed with COVID. And what it demonstrates, it broke it down into a low weight BMI, average BMI, and a high BMI. And what you could see here is that ICU admissions and intubations were much more likely seen in patients that were obese than in patients that weren't obese. And the death rate was highest actually in the uh, lower weight patients, which may reflect the fact that they may have had other health issues, et cetera. Bariatric surgery has also been demonstrated to be safe. This study looked at over 2000 patients from 35 countries. They all had bariatric surgery during the uh, pandemic. And we had 30 day morbidity mortality data on these patients. What you could see here are remarkable numbers, only one death at post op 18 in a COVID negative patient. Most of the complications were mild. 10 patients contracted symptomatic COVID for a very low incidence of 0.5%, but there were no deaths, there were no ICU admissions, and seven of the 10 patients required no treatment. Clearly a difference. And is bariatric surgery protective? In this study, a telephone survey of uh, 2,145 patients who uh, had bariatric surgery in the past, that uh, the uh, number of patients who developed symptoms suggestive of COVID was 8.4%, which is about the uh, average for, for people who are not overweight. But amongst that group, only 6% tested positive for COVID, so 0.6%. So most of them actually didn't even have COVID. 
and very few were admitted to the hospital and very few needed ICU care. So the bariatric surgery may have helped this group of patients ward off COVID to a greater degree than anything else that we had available to us. Now, I, I'm not suggesting we take a cavalier approach to things. COVID is still a dangerous and uh, deadly infection. So things have to be done differently. And it starts with the operating room. Instead of positive pressure ventilation, it needs to be negative pressure ventilation. We need to uh, minimize smoke by using closed circuit smoke evacuators and avoiding electrocautery in favor of energy devices that don't produce smoke like the ligature or the harmonic scalpel. Non-essential personnel need to be out of the operating room, particularly the first 20 minutes or so during intubation and induction, and also during the waking up and extubation phase at the end. Uh, the patient has to understand, number one, that uh, no one can accompany them to the hospital uh, for their surgery and visit them while they're in the hospital. They need to do a 14-day self-quarantine after surgery. They need to understand they'll all be tested for COVID-19 uh, one day prior to surgery, and many of them may end up getting a chest ultrasound, which is superior to a chest X-ray or CAT scan for looking for uh, pulmonary disease uh, from COVID. And the surgeon has to basically dress for battle, universal precautions, droplet and airborne precautions, double gloves, I think is critical, eye protection, shoe covers, and the use of the N95 masks. So what have we learned from the pandemic? We've learned that obesity is a risk factor for both contracting COVID-19 and for also having a poor outcome Bariatric metabolic surgery was performed safely in patients during the lockdown, during the pandemic, and previous uh, bariatric metabolic surgery proved to be protective. And few patients who have had surgery and had good results contracted COVID-19. So in conclusion, the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown created a new system for conducting surgery. And I have a feeling some of these changes are likely gonna remain in place. Bariatric metabolic surgery was designated as elective and completely shut down, but should it have been? I would suggest not. Ultimately, it was offered, but only to low risk candidates. And I would now say we have enough data to suggest that because high risk patients have much to benefit and that we can produce safe results even during COVID endemic, a pandemic, that we should be able to at least consider these patients for surgery and not universally reject them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Scott. And now we're gonna move on to uh, Christine's presentation for the endoscopist's uh, point of view. Dear chair ladies and chairmen, it is my pleasure and a great honor to make contribute to this eminent meeting and report the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on patients with obesity from the endoscopist's view. Here are my disclosures. COVID is like the plague. We had to learn about its, its contagiousness, special ventilation techniques, the cytokine storm, long COVID, neuro COVID, spike proteins, mutants and variants, and PPE, the personal protective equipment, as well as that COVID has a life-threatening impact on patients with obesity. Both are global pandemics and a serious threat to global health. Just as COVID has hit the entire world with the speed of a deadly hurricane, the obesity pandemic is much more comparable to the effects and speed of climate change and the init initial slow and now inexorably rapid melting of the poles. Obesity is more quiet than COVID much more quiet actually, and it does not attract as much attention as COVID does. And 
Just as climate change, it has been simply ignored for a long time as a chronic disease of pandemic magnitude. Both pandemics, COVID and obesity, generate high mortality rates and in people younger than 50 years of age, obesity appears to be the number one major risk factor for ventilator dependency, more severe causes and, and, and an increased COVID-19 mortality. The context for this seems to be the chronic inflammatory state that accompanies obesity. This leads per se to an abnormal cytokine production such as interleukin-6 as we were able to show with this study, but also to an increase of various other acute phase reactants with that apparently favoring and setting the trigger on the COVID-induced cytokine storm. But what in particular represents the endoscopist's view of the problem? At the beginning of the storm, the drama's first act, which was now more than one year ago, the world and us have been caught ice cold. Especially anesthesiologists and us endoscopists were and still are literally face to face or rather face to our soul and thus extremely and dangerously close to the contagi contagious virus. We had to understand and to learn this in the beginning of this lethal pandemic. We had to recognize that our work was actually permanently right on the front line of the virus. And the drama's climax appeared quickly. There was a global shortage of PPE, especially face masks. Under the threat of a warning, the wearing of masks on wards was banned in many German hospitals during March and April 2020. The unpreparedness and imprudence and thus the lack of equipment was declared a terrible waste of resources. Personal protective equipment was still a foreign word and initially sacrificed to cover this unpreparedness unbelievable from today's view. At that time, we had no clear idea, let alone knowledge of who to test, when to test, how to test, and last not least, what to test. Indeed, we had no idea at all what would expect us. Everyone spoke of the COVID pneumonia, not realizing that thrombosis, strokes, heart attacks, and gastrointestinal complaints would be just a part of the clinical picture. At that time, there was no general testing of all incoming patients, causing the virus to spread rapidly throughout hospitals and amongst personnel. And the rapid antigen test commonly used today for everything was not available for a long time yet. For us, there were no COVID guidelines we could have followed. And vaccination, was not much more than a dream and still a long way off. Shocked and with scariness, we observed what happened in Italy in those days in March 2020. But thank God, despite the fact that the Italian doctors have been working day and night in this horror scenario, they have simultaneously set up and created a platform on Facebook to inform the rest of the medical world about this terrible disease and what was going on. They shared everything they found out, how they tried to, tried to handle the situation and what we should expect. And with every ongoing hour, we have learned more and more, and more about it at a time when the significance of COVID officially was still compared to the flu. A little later, mid of 2020, this was a time when the IFSO Endoscopy Committee under the leadership of Barham Abu Daye posted a statement on the practice of bariatric endoscopy during the COVID pandemic as an evident guidance for endoscopists during these hard times. Carrying together all available knowledge, it was described how and what to test. That a bronchioalveolar lavage was the safest specimen followed by sputum and nasal swabs. P 
PPE adapted to the situation and the patient's infection, state, uh, infection status was recommended. Hairnet, goggles, face shields, the right kind of masks and gloves, and for the first time in, in endoscopy, a negative pressure room was discussed and recommended in case of a confirmed infection of the patient. Indeed, we have scaffolded ourselves like we never did before. And we had to learn to triage our patients in urgent, semi-urgent and elective, depending on their physical condition and needs. And unfortunately also how long interventions had to be postponed or maybe even had to be suspended. It was an attempt to shed light on the chaos around us and thus provide therapeutic certainty. The pandemic has now lasted much longer than we ever expected it would, comparable to a steady storm that we have to cope with. In reference to drama, this act is called retardation and this expression fits the situation. Many, Many patients were not diagnosed or treated during the pandemic, either because they were afraid to enter a hospital and catch COVID, or much more because hospitals were overcrowded with COVID patients and lacked capacity. Overall, significant fewer patients were treated that, uh, than would have been normally. Suspension of elective procedures resulted in further weight gain of affected patients thus leading to an individual intensification of their obesity disease. There is no official data, but we have followed this in our patients and all colleagues asked reported the same. And all the suspensions of the elect treatments led to a backlog of endoscopic bariatric therapies with many untreated cases who should have been treated already thus overall impacting negatively and resulting in an aggravation of the obesity pandemic in general. Therefore, from an endoscopist's view, there are two main negative impacts of COVID on obesity, the aggravation of obesity in the individual patient and the amplification of obesity epidemic itself, not only because all forces were joined to fight COVID. We do not yet know how many of our patients have deteriorated or died during the waiting period. Exact evident data regarding this query are not available as of right now as well. Finally, it seems there is light in the end of the tunnel and the last act that they know more arrives. As Einstein said, reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one, and this fits exact the context, uh, context. It is obvious and reality that we will have to live with the virus, but there is still a little bit of hope that the rest of the world will be vaccinated as soon as possible, even sleepy Europe. Israel and the USA have set a good example. And above all, let us get back to treating our patients with full speed to fight the obesity pandemic with the same force we have been fighting COVID-19. With that, let me end and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Steer, for a great uh, a philosophical uh, discussion. And now I'm going to uh, have Dr. Ivo Boskowski uh, present the gastroenterologist perspective. Hello, uh, everybody. I'm Ivo Boskowski, and I will talk about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on patients with obesity and um, the point of view of the gastroenterologist about uh, this situation. So um, these are my disclosures. Uh, COVID-19 uh, is a systemic disease. We know this very well. At the beginning, we thought this was a severe respiratory syndrome, but now what we know is that this is a very complex disease that can affect any, any organ in the human body and from vascular, cardiac, kidney, and so on. And especially gastrointestinal, uh, the gastrointestinal system with um, the consequence disorders in this, in this uh, district. 
So the impact of the COVID uh, pandemic in obese patients in gastroenterology can be in obese patients with gastrointestinal disorders that need uh, hospitalization and are COVID negative, and obese patients with gastrointestinal disorders that are COVID positive and are symptomatic. Uh, we know very well that ob obesity is a negative prognostic factor for uh, the infection, which is affected and is, um, has more than 25 of uh, body mass index is um, more prone to complications. Uh, which, if we associate this uh, with COVID, we'll see what will uh, follow. So uh, um, correlated with nutrition and obesity, we know that obesity is one of the most important epidemiological factors that underline the susceptibility to COVID-19 and potential interactions between the nutritional status and the immune function have been widely documented. So this is what we already know. Um, what we uh, just recently has been uh, published, uh, just what we just learned is that uh, when you have patients with um, overweight and obesity, undernutrition and other uh, diseases that are uh, uh, connected to, the, to obesity, hypertension, um, cardiovascular diseases and so on, uh, especially lack of lack of some vitamins like vitamin D, A, C and so on. Um, here is also uh, involved the AC2 uh, uh, receptor and the binding as binding sites for vitamin D. There is competition between the virus and this one. Um, all of this uh, in, 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 the in the complexity of the, of the situation with obesity uh, can lead to a uh, um, dramatic situation. Uh, especially from gastrointestinal point of uh, view. So in gastroenterology, there are many, many districts uh, that um, in the obese patients uh, are already involved in most of the patients like uh, fatty liver disease, uh, um, intestinal problems, inflammatory diseases, uh, common bile duct stones and uh, gallbladder stones, polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, diabetes, uh, and, and uh, so on. Um, why AC2 is important? Uh, because as I said before, um, uh, it is ex it, it, there is competition for, for uh, um, especially for AC2, and it is both, both expressed in the lungs and in the intestine, and not only AC2, also the transmembrane protein, serine protein two uh, proteins. Uh, um, we have published this uh, recently. Uh, regarding the thrilling journey of the SARS-CoV-2 um, into the intestine from pathogenesis to future clinical implications. So uh, we have seen uh, very, uh, we, we have postulated that uh, both the lung and the epithelium express, uh, we know this, uh, the AC2 receptor, the, that is recognized by the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, uh, to entry in the host cells where the, the virus starts to replicate. And in the lung, once the virus has entered in the cells, it uh, prompts immune cell activation characterized by pro-inflammatory cytokines and immune cell recruitment. In uh, um, viral clearance is not sufficient. The immune response further uh, progresses toward uh, cytokine storm syndrome in the gut. The virus targets the, the cells and uh, elicits the immune response in a similar fashion. So also it is not uh, yet clear whether the magnitude of the inflammatory response uh, reaches the same level uh, in the lung. We do not know um, uh, this. Um, the evidence of the gastrointestinal infection of uh, SARS-CoV-2 can be nicely seen here. This is a histologic and immunofluorescent staining of esophagus, stomach and duodenum and rectum. And, um, this had been also uh, nicely shown. What symptoms are, are um, usually um, um, described with the, what gastrointestinal symptoms are described with the COVID-19 infection are anorexia, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, uh, abdominal pain, and gastrointestinal uh, bleeding. The incidence of digestive manifestation in this, uh, in this uh, um, review of the data from 2023 patients was higher uh, in the later than in, in the early stage of the, epi, of the epidemic. Um, it's, um, you see here we mentioned gastrointestinal bleeding in 4% of the cases up to 13. Uh, we have also described this in an international multicenter study um, 
you can see what kind of lesions can be seen in the intestine. And uh, obese patients were 13.5 um, of, of uh, the cases and the disease where the disease was uh, severe. Um, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, or SARS-CoV-19 COVID is a disease, SARS-CoV-2 is an infection, can also the virus can be fine in the stools in uh, half in the patient, it is not too much, so, um, but how to reduce the fecal persistence of the uh, virus in, uh, in of the RNA, there is no evidence uh, based from, uh, from China, this is speculation. Uh, we can postulate uh, the rule of the gut microbiota in COVID-19 infection, Probably yes, we do not know. Um, this has been uh, shown in nature in 2006 when COVID-19 um, didn't exist, but the, the, the gut microbiota has thousands of implications um, in the human body. So probably there is correlation. What is, this is also uh, speculation. What could be the correlation between the infection and what can happen uh, with the intestine is uh, uh, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, here we have the low grade inflammation that is caused by the uh, infection of the SARS-CoV-2, the microbiota alteration and altered gut function that could lead to the irritable bowel, syn bowel syndrome. And what about IBD? Um, of course, we are not talking about Crohn's disease because Crohn's disease in the obese is really rare, uh, more ulcerative colitis. Um, even though, uh, even even if these patients, even if they take the anti-tumor necrosis factor alpha, um, um, like uh, uh, infliximab, humira, and so on drugs, um, and there is uh, 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 the immune system answers in a different mode in these patients. There is immunosuppression. Uh, uh, from the literature, we we know that there is not great impact of uh, in case of infection of COVID in this patient. So uh, if, if there is no uh, other data, um, there are a lot of uh, uh, speculations also here. What we can um, say that there is also here um, high concentrations of AC2 receptors in the terminal ileum and colon and there is competition both for the receptor and despite the fecal shading of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, in, in half of the patients, there is no clear evidence that the virus is spread via feces and infection occurs uh, through the intestine. So no uh, current evidence of increased infection rates or worsening of the disease severity of COVID-19 in IBD patients can be, can be registered. And um, in the end, uh, of course, uh, the obese patients are very complex patients. Obesity, dysbiosis, uh, polycystic ovary, and nuffold, and insulin resistance uh, can be all together in these patients. And if we add plus the, the COVID-19 um, uh, syndrome and the infection of SARS-CoV-2, of course, uh, we can imagine, uh, and the interleukin six, we can imagine the impact in the in the human body of the of these patients and the fragility of these patients. So, what we can suggest uh, that the special measures in obese patients with GI disorders um, should be adopted for infection preventions, and of course, these patients uh, should have priority in vaccination. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ivo. And now we have uh, Julie to talk to us about nutrition and COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to speak on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on patients with obesity and nutrition. We'll briefly look at the immune system and micronutrients, interactions, deficiencies, supplements, diets, and prevention. 39% of adults in the world are overweight with 13% of these adults being obese. In addition, we know that patients with obesity have some pulmonary dysfunction, comorbidities, chronic inflammation, and hypercoagulability. With COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus binds not only with ACE2 receptors in lungs, but spreads to other organ systems also with the ACE2 receptors, GI tract, adipocytes, heart, and kidneys. Thus, the immune system is dysregulated in patients with obesity. 
These factors are responsible for the disease severity and poor outcome in patients who are obese with COVID-19. We need a balance within the immune system to keep inflammation regulated. So how can we achieve this? The micronutrients listed in the box have key roles at every stage of the immune system, including creating physical barriers and being integral to the innate, inflammatory, and adaptive immune responses. Thus, the immune system requires micronutrients to function normally. There's been a great amount of research looking into micronutrients and combating the COVID-19 dysregulated immune response. We know that adipocytes in obesity release primarily pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, while adipocytes from lean individuals release more anti-inflammatory cytokines. Thus, the immune system is dysregulated in patients with obesity. We see the omega-3 fatty acids represented by the shark and vitamin E, C, and selenium up at the top of the slide. These act through antioxidant pathways to decrease the risk of infection. Zinc is a unique and vital mineral during COVID-19 infection because of its properties in modulating both the immune and the antiviral response. All of these micronutrients are involved in a fully functioning immune system. This slide shows the prevalence of micronutrient deficiencies in patients with obesity, a BMI greater than 35. However, under some conditions, deficiencies in a nutrient could be increased, as we see with vitamin B12. Patients who take PPIs have a 50% increase in B12 deficiency. When we look at zinc, we see a 24 to 28% prevalence of deficiency. So we might assume that zinc deficiency occurs in one out of every four patients with obesity. Zinc and other micronutrient deficiencies may result from a nutrient insufficient diet, poor or absorption, excessive loss of nutrients, micronutrient redistribution in intracellular and extracellular components, or a combination of these factors. We're unable to look at all the nutrients and their interactions, but we can look at zinc as an example. So zinc is a catalyst for hundreds of different enzymatic reactions throughout the body, including antioxidant function, digestion, skin integrity, et cetera. So what might early deficiencies look like? With the skin as a barrier, we might see rash. We might also see a change in or absence of taste, which sounds somewhat familiar for COVID-19. And we might also see a weakened immune system with recurrent infections. Zinc, is, zinc deficiency is also associated with insulin resistance, elevated inflammatory markers, and impaired immune system and antiviral response. Under some conditions, micronutrient deficiencies develop because of impaired absorption. Here are a few examples. Iron and zinc taken in large doses can inhibit absorption, so take therapeutic doses separately. High dietary zinc intakes decrease copper absorption by increasing copper sequestration in the mucosal cell bound to metallothionine and increases fecal excretion of copper. So take one milligram copper for every eight to 15 milligrams of zinc to avoid a copper deficiency. Don't take more than 40 milligrams of zinc, which is the upper limit daily. Albumin is the primary transport protein for some micronutrients. If albumin is decreased, then micronutrient levels will also be decreased. So can't we just take a pill? Sounds easy, but it's not quite so straightforward. For instance, there may be medication interactions affecting zinc or other micronutrient status. Make sure to look up potential interactions with some of them listed here, diuretics, ACE inhibitors, acid reducing meds, antibiotics, and hormone replacement therapy. So it's best not to assume that if one dose is not working, that more is better. Don't recommend a higher dose without considering potential interactions. Different supplementation strategies will vary for prevention versus treatment of the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we're currently focused on prevention. 
So how do we get enough zinc and other micronutrients? Under what conditions? What about our diet? So, okay, what about diets? We can see here that some of the foods pictured are part of a Western diet, which will not provide much zinc or other micronutrients. In fact, excessive eating of ultra-processed foods with low nutritional value can contribute to inflammation and even more micronutrient deficiency. So let's look at some good food sources of zinc and the foods here are listed by a realistic serving size and the amount of zinc provided. For example, a three ounce portion of beef, lamb or pork gives four to 10 milligrams of zinc. For those of you working with patients who use liquid meal replacements, typically a higher protein, a typical serving will provide two to three milligrams of zinc. This is usually 25 to 30% of the daily recommended zinc per serving. In the US, the daily recommended amount is between eight and 11 milligrams. In the UK, it's somewhat similar. However, the recommended level depends upon dietary phytate. Okay, what about other diets? Research shows that three of the diets listed in the table do have anti-inflammatory properties. <laughs> so the Mediterranean diet is rich with monounsaturated fats, fiber, and omega-3 fatty acids. The plant-based diet emphasizes whole, minimally processed foods. It does not include animal sources of protein, so we may encounter some um, missing nutrients. The DASH, which is Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, emphasizes servings and portions, and it does allow more sweets per week. The ketogenic diet, it focuses on macronutrients, limits daily carbohydrates intake to less than 50 grams with fat as the primary macronutrient followed by protein. It may reduce weight, but without dietary modifications, the research shows it increases intestinal inflammation. Intermittent fasting based on timing, eating during a specified time period. So there may be strict or liberal food choices. Intermittent fasting may be anti-inflammatory, however, only indirectly via weight loss and food modifications. If you aren't familiar with the Mediterranean diet pyramid, this infographic is a great illustration of foods to consume with meals every day and weekly as you proceed from the bottom of the pyramid up to the top. It's available in 11 different languages and I've put a link in the references for you. The Mediterranean diet is an anti-inflammatory diet that limits foods consumed in a Western diet. It includes the variety and amount of foods that could potentially meet all of a healthy person's dietary needs. But for patients with obesity and those who contract COVID-19 and may become long haulers, the need for micronutrients may be much, much different. So in summary, micronutrients. Assume that patients with obesity are deficient in one or more micronutrient and screen for deficiencies. And this is pertaining to patients with obesity. Count the amount of micronutrients from all sources to ensure an adequate daily intake. Avoid taking micronutrients at the same time as some other prescriptions or medications or even other micronutrient competitors. And with regard to diet, decrease your intake of high sugar, fat, salty, processed foods. Lose weight to improve health. Use any of the above three diets for metabolic and bariatric surgery. Following these principles can help to avoid a dysregulated immune system and therefore decrease your susceptibility and the severity of COVID-19. Thank you very much. I do have three pages of references if you are interested. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that great presentation. And now I'd like to invite our panelists and speakers. Uh, we have a lot of questions from the attendees and other attendees. If you have other questions, please feel free to ask um, on the uh, uh, question section of your of your box. Um, so I'd like to start with um, with uh, both Dr. Shakura and uh, Dr. Steer. When you're doing um, any type of either endoscopy or surgery, are you still asking patients to get uh, COVID tested beforehand? And also Dr. Uh, Morton, if you wanna comment on that too. But if I might start, yes, we do test every patient still. Same with us, yes. 
<clears throat> Same here, absolutely. We test yeah, we every do day. Almost and, and same here, I don't think that's going to yeah. change anytime soon. Um, Dr. Aroni, um, we, we touched upon sort of the GI aspect of obesity, surgical and endoscopy. Do you want to sort of give us uh, how you think it's affected um, your patients with obesity, um, either in, in numbers that you've seen um, come up after, after the COVID pandemic opened up or um, just how they've affected them? Interestingly, Dr. Shirai, well, first of all, thank you for having me at this meeting. I wish we could all be somewhere together and I look forward to uh, next year. But uh, interestingly, there has been a massive increase in interest among patients uh, who want to lose weight. Our uh, volume of patients has increased at our comprehensive weight control center by over 15% in the past year. Uh, despite the interruption where for almost two months, we, we saw almost no one, the ref, you know, when you look at the year as a whole, our patient volume was increased. What we do is perfectly suited to telehealth, uh, which is mainly advising patients on their diet and adjusting medications. We, we prescribe medication and have gotten good results. We see a lot of surgical patients, post-surgical patients, and uh, so when you look at the link between obesity and COVID severity, which I think is irrefutable, uh, I think more people are recognizing that if they want to avoid severe COVID, they may be interested in losing weight. So I think that the, you know, what we've heard about uh, stopping bariatric surgery being a bad idea is absolutely true, and I would point out one study uh, earlier this year published in SWORD uh, from the Cleveland Clinic, which was a case control study showing that of uh, patients who had had bariatric surgery, 18% who were COVID uh, positive were hospitalized versus 45% of matched controls, 18% versus 45%. None of the patients who had bariatric surgery wound up in the ICU, mechanically ventilated or uh, dying versus substantial numbers of patients in the control group who had not lost weight. So I, I think that um, you know, we're really understanding the physical burden of severe obesity. And I think that surgery and all of the treatments that we now have are um, you know, should be more supported by insurance here in the U.S. and, and elsewhere. I, I think it's pretty clear. Hopefully, hopefully someone somewhere is listening from the insurance companies. Um, Dr. Sharma, I wanted to ask you sort of the same question um, about patients you've seen in, in Canada. What have, what have you noticed in the last year or so? You're, you're muted. Well, uh, sorry about that. Uh, well, thanks for having me on the panel. Uh, well, obviously, one of the biggest differences uh, is that now virtually all of our patients are seen virtually. Uh, and this turns out to actually have a lot of advantages. Uh, you know, you can increase the number of patients you're seeing. You can see them more frequently. Um, you know, in, in our clinic in Alberta, sometimes patients have large geographic distances to cover. You know, sometimes they drive six hours to get to the clinic for a, you know, 15 minute appointment. Uh, so that has all gone away. And I think that, uh, you know, this virtual medicine, uh, at least for patients who are in follow-up, I think is going to stay because it's, uh, you know, once you figure out the, uh, you know, how to do it and once patients will also get comfortable with using the technology, which, you know, everybody has on their iPhone or their, their smartphone, uh, has actually proven to be quite efficient. Uh, in terms of the impact on the patients themselves, it's quite interesting because you know you hear two stories. You hear the stories where people are stressed out. Um, you know they're economically stressed. They're stressed because they're at home. The kids are at home. Um, you know they're worried. Uh, and there's certainly an increase in stress eating there. There's probably less physical activity because all of the gyms and you know recreational facilities are closed. Um, you know, we also had a pretty prolonged winter, so people weren't able to go outside. Uh, so, so those are the negative impacts. Uh, but uh, I've also heard from a lot of patients about positive impacts. Uh, and, and these include the fact that you're much more in control of your day. 
um, you don't have the, you know, you have a lot more time on your hands because you're no longer commuting, you know, two or three hours a day to wherever you need to go. Um, a lot of people have taken up cooking, uh, meal preparation at home, something that families just would not do before. Uh, you remember the early part when, you know, the supermarkets ran out of, out of yeast and flour, at least in Canada, because everybody was baking their bread. Uh, and a lot of that, you know, those changes in eating habits where families are sitting together and, and, and you know, home cooking is happening. Uh, people who didn't have time for physical activity before actually started physical activity now at home. Uh, again, using all kinds of online resources. Uh, we know the sale of, um, you know, the sales for exercise equipment went up uh, radically when, this, uh, when, the, when the epidemic started. Uh, there's also another interesting aspect and that close, and, and I've heard this, you know, from a lot of patients who say that not having to go leave the house uh, no longer exposed them to the daily weight bias and fat shaming and fat talk that they're exposed to when they, every time they leave their house, uh, which uh, it turns out is a, is a huge, you know, psychological stressor for a lot of patients, you know, having to go out and then if you're in a work environment, there's teasing, there's bullying, there's, there, there's, um, yeah, you know, there's potluck lunches where you can't refuse to partake in. Uh, so there's a lot of that, those type of negative impacts that people did not have to cope with just because they were now, like I said, in better control of their life. So, so I've heard both stories. So we've had this negative impact and there's people who are complaining and saying, you know what, this is out of control. My weight's going up. I'm less physically active. I've got more stress. Uh, there's more depression, more anxiety, uh, other things going on, relationships breaking up. Uh, we've heard a lot about those kind of issues. Uh, uh, but I've also heard a lot of positive stories and uh, we'll see how much of this remains. I think a lot of the home office stuff is going to, is going to stick on and I think virtually care uh, for probably not just for obesity, but for all chronic diseases has, uh, has been dramatically changed. And I think that's going to, you know, that's going to stay changed. Great. Um, for Dr. Mortson, um, due to the ease of lockdowns, um, maybe because of vaccination and the rates uh, dropping lower, do you see an increase in the number of surgical patients prevent, presenting with advanced stages of disease requiring bariatric surgery? Well, uh, thank you to WGO and to IFSO and Reem for, for putting this panel on. Uh, we definitely have seen more interest and uh, patients for bariatric surgery. In fact, it's been like a J-shaped recovery for us. Um, and I think people have um, started to pay more attention to their weight. We know the two biggest risk factors for COVID are age and weight. Only one of those is modifiable at, currently. And so we have seen a lot more interest in it. And I think to Scott's point earlier, we never again want to see bariatric surgery stop. That delay does lead to more complications for these patients. And uh, as a mitigating factor, we put patients on medications when we didn't have options like GLP-1s. It also had a big financial impact on hospitals. It demonstrated how much elective surgery matters for hospitals. We are now recommending three months uh, of cessation for surgery after the COVID diagnosis because it correlates very well with that peak of inflammation. And we know if anything about obesity, it is a disease of inflammation. Like Lou and Dr. Sharma have indicated, there are some big lessons to be learned. Uh, telemedicine is here to stay, but I would add telehealth will come forward too. And by that, I mean, we're going to look to do remote monitoring of some of our patients after surgery so they don't have to stay in the hospital for so long. And um, I think at the end of the day, we're also going to be seeing this population of the long haul COVID patients. So a lot of lessons. And so far, we've seen more interest. The lockdown has resulted on average in 30 pound weight gain through a couple of longitudinal mm. studies. So I think we're going to see more and more impact from this. Lou, to follow on with that, are you seeing more patients sort of uh, interested in the BMIQ platform? I know that there are other platforms out there as well, uh, just increasing the tele telehealth components. Yes, our, our program is now called IntelliHealth uh, Evolve. And we've spent years building, testing um, a whole uh, telehealth platform to deliver obesity medicine care, which includes evidence-based algorithms to support the use of, of medications that, that we use, as well as all the behavioral tools. And what we're seeing is enormous interest by insurance companies. So we've taught uh, 
nurse practitioners at one of the large insurance companies how to use our, our approach. They've treated their employees. And what we're seeing is a cost benefit that's positive. And if you look at the barriers to getting uh, insurance coverage in the United States for this kind of care and, and around the world, I think you know, it's grossly underutilized. The obesity treatment, I, you will all agree that two or 3% of people who qualify for the kind of care that we offer and you offer uh, is two to 3% are getting it at most. Um, but what we're seeing is a positive return on investment from both behavioral care alone, using our telehealth type programs, as well as the medical programs. And the point of using this type of platform is that the, the insurers are nervous that they're gonna be throwing money out the window and not getting the results that they're paying for. So by using these types of platforms, you can actually report back results and they can feel confident that they're getting their money's worth. And we actually are showing insurers this. So uh, several large insurance companies and healthcare companies around the country are now in the pilot phase using IntelliHealth to scale up um, programs, obesity medicine programs. And I, I would expect that this is the beginning of, of a shift because it's now um, not only cost beneficial to, to the payer, but the endocrine division at Weill Cornell could potentially make money. And uh, if, if you look at, at academic centers, this is not a money-making uh, endeavor. It's been kind of a loss leader. If we could actually make money because we, it costs less to house people, they can work from home. We may actually see obesity medicine as a field begin to grow in academia. And I think that will be good for our surgical colleagues, our GI colleagues, because we're the biggest referrers for those procedures. When obesity medical treatment doesn't work, we're, we're referring to our colleagues all the time. So I believe we're at the beginning of a pivot uh, towards uh, obesity medicine and surgery and, and GI procedures. I really do. Thank you. We have a couple of questions um, for Dr. Shakura. Um, mainly one was technical about the method of bariatric surgery, whether you would use open or endoscopic, uh, open endoscopic or laparoscopic uh, to reduce the risk of infectivity. Um, and is there a need to increase the precautionary measures in these different approaches? Uh, to answer the second one first, I think we need to increase our protective uh, behavior from where it is now, but it should be the same for everybody at all times. Uh, we should always have that protective gear on and double glove and eye covers and all that waterproof. And I think that should be for any case, not just those with patients with COVID or the risk of COVID. As far as the first one, there's no literature on it, but I don't think anybody does much open surgery anymore. And I don't think this is an indication for open. I think that might be more risky than laparoscopic because of the big open field and the likelihood of droplets or uh, small amounts of fluid getting onto the operative team would be greater. I really can't comment on endoscopy. Uh, obviously, that's also an area where you'd have a lot of the potential for droplets and for... Uh, uh, humidity, humidity to, to spread virus, but I, I don't know of any uh, papers that suggested that was in fact the case. So I think the most important thing are the precautions. Keep the people in the operating room limited to only those that are necessary for the opening and the closing. Use smokeless uh, uh, equipment. Protect yourself by double gloving, eye covers, waterproof gowns, et cetera. And uh, I think, it, once again, my opinion is that should be for all cases because it, it, it can be an issue with the next uh, virus that comes around as well. So we should protect ourselves at all times. Don't forget uh, vaccines. That's the ultimate yes. PPE. I agree, and there's a sort of a question on that, um, How and that was uh, to Evo. Um, do you, how do you encourage your patients who are um, sort of hesitant about getting the vaccine? Do you sort of tell them that 
it may improve some of their uh, GI symptoms or some of their long haul COVID symptoms or what's your approach with that? But just before you answer, I, I just want to comment that it's it's universal precautions and, and what we had to sort of talk to our hospital about is that we don't know who has COVID or who has other diseases that are not that are unknown to us and we should always dress the same and act the same regardless of what we think or know about our patients. I think that came out of the experience with HIV, which was the same thing. We had no clue about the virus, how it reacted, how did it spread, how do you protect against it? And at the time, surgeons were very casual about even eye covers. So their eyes were exposed and the, the water droplets could get up into the, in, through the mucous membranes and into the body. So I think uh, now there's more of an effort to have universal precautions, but it should be for every case, regardless of who the patient is, because you just don't know what the exposure could be uh, to any given person coming to the operating room. Yeah, I can, I, I can add something to this. You know, uh, obese patients, basically, they know that they are fragile. So they do protect themselves. If, if you talk with them, they will say they, they, they mostly stay at home or when they go to work, they, they, they went really protected. And this, this was my, my impression when, every time when I spoke with them. Now when uh, vaccines came, most of the questions were, which kind of vaccine should I do? Should I do this one or that one and so on? So my answer was that I th is what I think that my, the vaccines all, almost are all the same. So uh, whatever they do, the, as soon as they're protected, that, that's, that's good because all behind, I think, is politics. That. Uh, from a second, um, what I would like to add uh, besides that is that we just published a paper in GUT uh, on uh, COVID, on endoscopes used in uh, critically ill patients that were COVID positives. COVID positive, we did swabs on those endoscopes uh, because we aim to, to evaluate our process of, uh, of um, endoscopes reprocessing. And what we found, we could not uh, complete the study because all the swabs down immediately after endoscopy in uh, COVID positive patients were negative. We did swaps on the endoscopes, on the valves, on the channels of suction, and we did that, we did that also on bronchoscopes. So yes, we, we do use uh, GONS, we use uh, F, uh, N95 masks, we, we use uh, face shields, but then uh, probably the risk of infection, also of aerosolization of the virus is lower than we think from one hand in endoscopy, from the other, uh, it is enough to stay close to a person that is infected to get infected. And there are many, many things that we still do not know about this virus. So true. Julie, um, can you comment on, uh, we, we talked a little bit about uh, telehealth and, and sort of the surgical and endoscopic and obesity aspect, but what about nutrition um, and uh, di dietitian consultations? Have you noticed the shift? Has it happened? Oh, yeah. Compliance, tell me about that. Um, well, uh, as an outpatient dietitian um, in, in one particular clinic, uh, the volume essentially tripled. So, you know, there's always mention of um, professional or practitioner burnout. So I, I always say that we had indirect, you know, effects of um, COVID-19, not that we were directly interacting with a patient who's infected, but because the volume went increased, you know, or increased dramatically, then the wear and tear on the practitioners just became un unbelievable. So that's, I guess, one particular thing. And then another that I found kind of interesting and in listening to you guys um, was the fact that I do hear more from my patients um, that they are starting to really take some of these, what they call anti-inflammatory or anti-COVID um, um, supplements. And so that's a little bit concerning, especially with some of them like zinc, because you can pretty quickly get into a, um, deficiencies in other nutrients. And there's still not the, the knowledge of, you know, how much there's a balance, you know, especially with somebody who becomes infected with COVID-19, you know, there's going to be this protective mechanism that the body does to sequester some of these nutrients, but yet the body still needs enough to provide the uh, functioning immune system. 
So that's one area when I was doing all this research that is still just, it's, it, nobody knows. Um, assays, if we're telling patients to go screen these vitamins, go get this lab done, there's no accurate lab <laughs> for, for zinc or for vitamin C. So I think we all need to become much more proficient in our clinical skills and acumen. You know, how do we know what a deficiency looks like? Because a lot of times these labs may become, come back normal, but the person has symptoms that indicate a deficiency. Very, very good point. Um, and that was sort of a part two, uh, someone asked, had asked you a question about what, what labs to, to measure. Um, uh, Evo, there's another question for you on, now that we're seeing more patients with higher stages of uh, GI diseases due, due to the lockdown, uh, what are you seeing typically and how has it hindered or helped your, your uh, management? So, yes, uh, most of the patients belong to the IBD group that uh, could not access the, the health system because they were afraid to come to the hospital. You know, patients with IBD once per month or something like that are, are, um, are getting uh, anti-tumor necrosis factor alpha drugs and similar. So uh, those patients, some of those had really relapses of disease. You can imagine uh, um, those patients with Crohn's disease and fistulas. Um, we have seen, uh, I'm not directly in, in involved in the treatment of IBD, but I work close together with the colleagues treating those. So it was really an emergency. And uh, the other thing is in endoscopy because uh, uh, since we were doing only emergencies uh, as, as everywhere, uh, there is rise in, uh, in colon cancer diagnosis uh, and and this is the, another <laughs> pandemic uh, because now that we we started doing the screenings and uh, doing follow-ups and checking patients uh, we are seeing things that that were not seen for 10 15 years almost every day there is cancer almost every day there is something strange neuroendocrine tumors and so on probably before we we're doing uh, too much screenings but in the in the past year and a half, we did uh, only only a few patients, so it's it's natural to have this. Um, I agree on that. We've actually now in the U.S. Uh, decreased the age as when to start screening to screen, forty five, which which I think we're we're seeing a lot of <laughs> uh, patients with with polyps, and uh, we've heard the cancer obesity talk earlier, and it just goes to show that they all go hand in hand. Um, Christine, I wanted you to comment on, on sort of what you're seeing uh, with you. You've had, you have both the prongs of endoscopy and, and surgery. Um, and how are you seeing COVID um, affect your practice? And, and how has it changed over the last few months with everything opening up? Um, I just can echo what Scott said before. Um, all the elective procedures were uh, suspended in Germany. Uh, and uh, the drama is that uh, bariatric patients are called elective, but they aren't. Um, and uh, what I really wanted to know is um, how many of those did die on the waiting list? And I know in our in our cohort, uh, surely one or two. Um, and this is this is really a question I would spread around, and we all should uh, we all should find out this because it's very important. Um, and uh, this is really a big problem because, as we heard earlier today, obesity has a real high input on 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 cancer, a really high input um, with comorbidities. And um, it, it is really, it, it was really not right to suspend all these elective procedures. And uh, this is a pity. We have a long, long waiting list of patients now for both, for both endoscopy and surgery. So it's, I, it's been a real problem for us as well, not only for elective, but even some of the semi-urgent. Uh, we have a paper we did showing that the cholecystectomies and appendectomies were more advanced uh, in that time period because people just stayed home. And you saw that with heart attacks too. So people need to come back. There's a movement uh, to ask people, make sure you come back, don't delay. Yeah, absolutely. So we talked about sort of uh, 
presenting to surgery or presenting to endoscopy for um, uh, for obesity treatment. What about have you have any of you noticed? I mean, I, I definitely noticed sort of the COVID fifteen or COVID nineteen, however you want to call it, with patients that have already undergone uh, some sort of treatment for for their obesity, either uh, endoscopic treatment or surgical treatments. They've all over the last year uh, gained some weight. How are you all coping with that? I think there's been a variety of responses. So we've seen people lose weight because they're not going out eating all the time. So we have people who entertain for business, for example, and they're cooking at home. Those people, I would say by and large have lost, but then the majority of people have gained weight because they're very inactive and uh, maybe comforting themselves by eating uh, more fattening food, ordering out a lot. So I think, you know, we've seen a, a lot of weight change over this period of time, you know, not, not as much weight stability. And, and I would add to that, it's, it's not just the eating more. I've also, you know, had conversations with patients about their alcohol intake, which has also gone up dramatically uh, because they no longer have to drive. They're sitting at home. Uh, you know, the, the glass of wine that you have at home is usually twice the glass of wine that you would get in a restaurant. Uh, so serving sizes is, is certainly an issue. So, you know, that's also a source of calories. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's like, I mean, all of you have seen this and, and Lou's alluded to this. Uh, it, it's been very heterogeneous, you know, some, for some people, you know, this was, this was the right thing at the right time, uh, funnily enough, but for a lot of people, you know, it was, it's a problem. So, you know, which again goes to show how heterogeneous uh, this population is. Um, because, um, you know, in obesity, if there's one thing we've learned is that, you know, one, one size does not fit all. Uh, and, uh, you know, this was to be expected that people are going to respond very differently depending on, you know, whatever is driving their weight gain, whatever is affecting the, their lives. Uh, you know, so, I'm, so we're not surprised by this, but, uh, you know, it is, it's, it is certainly very interesting to note. We certainly have seen more weight gain you know, of our, our bariatric patients. Um, and those, that long, those longitudinal studies were pretty compelling. Most people gained weight, upper west side, notwithstanding the, but, you know, we see those patients now are even in more need of surgery or medications. And what we've probably done is work harder to get some of these patients to lose weight before surgery, because we know stage of disease will determine effectiveness of response. So we're doing our best to kind of uh, mitigate some of that weight gain, but it certainly has happened. But that the other side of the coin, a lot more interest, a lot more interest than there was before. Um, so we're, we're, we have a big uh, time period now between seeing patients and then going to surgery. And so uh, working hard on fixing that so we get patients taken care of. I completely agree. It's the same. It's the same in, in our department. We have a Big uh, uh, time span between seeing the patients and doing the operations, and um, agreeing with Aya. Yes, it's very heterogeneous. Uh, a lot of patients gained weight, um, but there was indication that uh, that younger patients uh, who normally eat from the fast food restaurants, they lo they lost a little bit of weight because they it wasn't available for them, but. Uh, the other patients who, who really eat because they have anxiety or, or whatever, they really gained. And the greatest part of I, our patients also gained weight. I would agree. I did want to make people... Go ahead. I was just going to say real quick, Scott, that we, we have one study where we looked at long-term results uh, after COVID positive patients that got operated on after they were three months out. And the effectiveness of the operation is not diminished. It's the same as as COVID negative. So something to keep in mind because people ask, you know, oh, I, I was COVID before, is this still gonna work? It does work. And that's true of the medications too. Yeah, and that's I've why been surprised. I surprised. I'm so sorry, Scott. <laughs> I was just gonna say, that's why I felt the criteria that you had not had a COVID infection was ridiculous. Um, I was just gonna say that I've seen a big upsurge just to, plug this, um, patients actually doing more exercise in home. So that, that was really kind of fascinating. It's like, how, how are they making the time? How do they have the space? But many of the patients I've met with are doing that. It's true. 
Um, thank you all very much for a very lively discussion and, and great presentations. And it just goes to show you that the sort of the two pandemics really do intermingle and, and mix and we have a lot to learn. Um, I'd like to um, close this session and invite uh, Dr. Lillian Cowan, Dr. Guillermo um, Mercado to, to uh, close our session. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very for much. Moderating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, I hope you have found this World Digestive Health Day 2021 webinar on obesity and ongoing epidemic as interesting and inspiring as I have. We could not have a more esteemed faculty today, and I sincerely thank all our speakers and panelists for their time and for sharing their knowledge with us today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors for their support of this wonderful collaboration between the two federations, if so, and WGO. So I'd like to thank our platinum sponsors, BioCodex, our silver sponsors, Apollo, Baxter, and Go, and many thanks to Ethicon and Medtronic for their continual support to, to if so, as well as WGO. It's also important to thank the people behind the scenes. And these are the people who have made 2021 World Digestive Health Day possible and for making the webinar run so smoothly. Firstly, I'd like to thank Manuela Mezzarella, our if so Chief Operating Officer, Marisa Lopez, Executive Director of WGO, Megan Ullenhaker, Program Manager for WGO, and Stefania Ekenfora from MGM for the smooth organization of this meeting. Last but not least, I would also like to thank and acknowledge Professor Jim Tooley, who's a past president of WGO, who has been instrumental in bringing together IFSO and WGO. Many thanks to you, Jim. And for future planning, I would like to invite everyone to the 25th World Congress of IFSO 2021. The silver anniversary will be in Miami in October 19 to the 23rd. Finally, a big thank you to both my co-chairs, Professor Golami Macedo and Professor Reem Sharaya. It has been a privilege for me to share the co-chairs with both of you today. Hence, I'm gonna give you both the last words on this wonderful World Digestive Health Day webinar. Thank you, Reem. Um, probably you want to say some words now because I was overwhelmed by our uh, conclusion for uh, Professor Lillian Kao. Thank you so much for your words, very kind words. Um, also for the fact that, and acknowledging uh, Professor Jim Tooley that was really with us all the time and he was really instrumental for this, this wonderful joint venture from WGO and, and if so. And just a final word for uh, um, telling that uh, at the end of this year in December in Prague, we'll have um, our annual meeting uh, WGO with um, with inter international meeting with the uh, Czech Republic and the the in Prague so that and we all invite you to participate uh, hopefully in a hybrid situation which was which means that fortunately we think we'll be able to get along with each other physically which is great thank you I have nothing to add except to say thank you so much. It was great uh, collaboration between WGO and IFSO, and uh, we hope everyone uh, enjoyed the day. And uh, thank you to our sponsors and to our, our uh, behind the scene uh, people who helped us make this a success. <laughs>